Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Mina san konnichiwa. My name is Yoshi Domoto. I am the executive director of the Japan America Society of Georgia, and I'm so happy to have so many people with us joining us today's、uh, webinar, the Japan America Society of Georgia's Executive Dialogue Series. We have a very important topic to cover today、uh, as we will be talking about navigating the current visa restrictions and immigration guidance、uh, for foreigners here in the US. Special thank you and a special shout out to、uh, one of our board members of the Japan America Society, Mr. Tim Evans、uh, from the、uh, Greater Hall County、uh, Chamber of Commerce for in Gainesville.、Uh, it was、uh, his idea to put together this program, and we have an all star panel with you today. So, So, we are so lucky and, and、uh, happy to have you all today. But without further ado, we would like to get started.、Uh, so, on our panel today,、uh, we have the partner from Taylor English,、uh, Ms. Masai Okura. Hello, Okura Sensei. Hi, thank you for having me today. And from Kubota Manufacturing of America, we have two all star panelists,、uh, Mr. Phil Sutton and Mr. Yuta Umezaki. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much for being with us.、Uh, and then、uh, we also have the chair of the Japan American Society, Mr. Al Hodge, with us, who will be part of our discussions and making、uh, closing remarks. So thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Hodge. Certainly. And then our moderator,、uh, she is the CEO and founder of Michiki Morgan Worldwide.、Uh, and she has been doing an excellent job of moderating all of our webinars. Uh, since uh, the pandemic started,、uh, gosh, it seems like a lifetime ago, but、uh, with a virtual round of applause, let's welcome Ms. Nozomi Morgan. Nozomi san, yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.、Um, Okura sensei, Phil, Umezaki san, Al, Gus san, thank you so much for being here today. This is very exciting. Such a timely topic.、Um, so excited we're doing this today. Okay, so、um, let's get started. So, this is a topic near and dear to my heart.、Um, I、um, was born and raised in Japan, and I came to the US、um, on a student visa. And、um, so, I, when, I, when I heard this change, it really,、um, it really hit my heart、um, very hard because I know the, the stress and how、um, this really impacts so many, so many people's lives,、um, especially、um, today we're talking about from、uh, Employer standpoint or a professional standpoint, but because I first came here as a student,、um, I know how that feels.、Um, and, and then just the, you know, the, the change and just not the uncertainty of not really knowing what this really means and not knowing what tomorrow night may be,、uh, may be you know, all of that just adds so much stress to, to what everyone is already feeling. Um, through this COVID 19. So,、um, we are so grateful、uh, to be able to pr、uh, present this topic with、um, the top immigration lawyer, Ms.、Uh, Masaya Okura, and then having、um, one of the、um, biggest Japanese employers, Japanese company employers here in Georgia, to share their experience and sharing their、uh, wisdom with our community today. So, I would love to start with、um, Okura Sensei so she can give us, you know, really that, you know, this is such a big topic. I know she can go into details, but we've asked her to really break it down and bring it, bring it really down to focus on the most important、um, point. So, she only has about 20 to 30 minutes top max.、Um, so, please, Okura Sensei,、uh, let us, what's, what's going on? Okay, yeah, so thank you for having me. So, usually this kind of seminar goes beyond two hours, but I only have 20 minutes. So, I'm trying to rush through, and there's some details in the slides. So, if you want to go into details, you could look at the slides later on, but I'm just going to just glimpse over the slides. And same here, I came here as a student and、um, went to law school and business school, and I and got my work visa and got my green card. So, I went through the same process every, everyone's going through. So, I know how frustrating this is for everyone. So, when COVID 19 started, in, well, it started back last year, but when it really became a problem this、um, March of this year,、um, the U- US government actually um, um, made some ban on people coming from certain countries. And as of now, people coming from China, Iran,、um, Euro- certain European countries, And United Kingdom's Republic of Ireland and Brazil, these people,、um, if you have been to this country for the 14, past 14 days, then you are not able to come into the United States. 
uh, there is an exception. If you are a U.S. citizen or green card holders, you can still come into the U.S. from these countries, but you have to quarantine yourself, quarantine yourself for like 14 days. And then there's another restriction um, uh, on travel restriction between the borders. Now, people traveling between the U.S. and Mexico and Canada, so non-essential trips are prohibited at this moment. Oh, um, the slide, we're talking about number one on the slide right now. Um, so new existing immigrant immigration restrictions for Japanese company and national. So we're going through number one right now. There's another um, border um, um, travel restrictions on borders and essential um, trips are um, allowed. And what is considered essential or non-essential, if you want to come to the United States go, to go to Disneyland or just to have fun with your friends, that's not considered an essential trip. So you cannot come into the United States and you cannot go into Canada or Mexico for the same purpose. But people who have a valid work visa or a student visa, these people could come into the U.S. or go to Mexico or Canada on a business trip. So those are considered essential. So if you have a valid visa, then yes, you can travel to these countries. So, and then um, we'll go to the next um, slide. So after this, um, coronavirus got out of hand, <laughs> out of control, and things didn't really improve. So it, on um, April 22nd, uh, President Trump issued a presidential proclamation. It's like an executive order, but he um, issued a presidential proclamation. Um, initially, he wanted to ban a lot of people from coming into the United States. But of course, um, there were a lot of voices from the business world and just individuals. So he narrowed it down to people who are applying for a green card outside the United States. So this proclamation does not prohibit people who are currently in the U.S. to apply for green cards. These people are safe. But if um, you're trying to apply for a green card from outside of the country and you're outside stuck, then you cannot apply for a green card until... Well, it was supposed to end on June 22nd, but the new proclamation extended that to the end of the year. And there's some ex exceptions to this proclamation. If you are a spouse or a child under 14 of a U.S. citizen, then you're exempted. So if you're an immediate family member of a U.S. citizen, then you can still apply for green cards outside of the country. So that was number one. So, that's, um, so that was the um, April. Um, proclamation. And then in um, June, things got really bad, coronavirus out of control, and we're seeing a lot of unemployment in the United States. So things are really bad now. So President Trump decided to prohibit certain temporary um, work visa immigrants from coming into the United States to help the American workers to get back to work. So the in June now, um, he is now prohibiting certain people, um, people in certain visa categories, which is H-1B specialty occupation, um, H-2B non-agricultural worker visa, we're on slide seven, and then L-1 intercompany transfer visas, and J-1 exchange visitors. So J-1 exchange visitors, there's 14 kind of programs. And um, the, prohi the pro prohibition is only against those who's coming to the U.S. to work or for training, which is the internship program, training program, teacher, um, teacher, this teacher is for like elementary school or like middle school, high school teachers, camp counselors, au pair program, summer work, um, summer work travel program for um, university students who are outside the U.S. And, um, and those are the categories that's prohibited under the new pro proclamation. Okay, so who are, um, who are subject to this proclamation? So they, uh, the proclamation says that this applies to people who were outside the United States as of June 24th and who did not have the appropriate, a valid visa at that time. So if you were outside the U.S. on the 24th of Ju June and you had a valid L visa or H-1B or J-1, you can come into the U.S. That's fine. If you were outside of the U.S. on the date, on the 24th, and you did not have a valid visa and you have to apply for a valid visa after the 24th, then you cannot apply for a new visa. So that's what, and if you were in the U.S. on the 24th and you had a valid visa, that's fine. You can stay in the U.S. And if you were in the U.S. on that date and, and your visa stamp expired, but your stay is still valid, you could still stay in the United States. But we are, we do not know, we, um, it's kind of uncertain whether people who are currently in the U.S., who were in, in the U.S. on the 24th, 
and their visa expired, whether they can go back to Japan to extend their L visa H-1B or H-2 visa. We, um, the proclamation does not talk about renewals. So we're still waiting for the government to clarify those kind of points. So um, some people are exempt from this category. Of, of course, there's some exceptions to it. So people who are coming to the U.S. to engage in essential positions to enhance the U.S. food supply chain, these people can apply for H-1B visas or L-1 visas or, or H-2B or J-1, whatever the case may be, that these visas that are prohibited from um, having their visas issued. So if you're, if you're engaging in an essential food supply chain um, business, then yes, you can still apply for it. Or if you can prove that your um, contribution to the U.S. or your work in the U.S. is, is of national interest, to the U.S., like you're benefiting the U.S., uh, um, the, the U.S. country as a whole, or benefiting the people, um, then if you can make that case, then yes, you could um, qualify under the exception and you can still apply for L-1 visas or H-1B visas. And um, the, the points in blue, these were not in the proclamations, but later on, um, some of our immigration lawyers associations spoke with the government officials and they clarified that Canadians are usually visa exempt. They can just apply for um, a status at the border. They don't have to go to the embassy and apply for a visa like everyone else. But Canadian visa exempt Canadians people are not subject to the rule. And um, those who had a valid visa prior to or on the 24th, Regardless of whether they were in the U.S. at the time or whether they were outside the U.S. at that time, these people are fine. They can still stay in the U.S. and um, if they have a valid visa, they can come into the U.S. So these people are not affected. So um, yes, I was um, asked to talk about restrictions on visa issuance and H-1B cap. So the good news is if you're in the U.S. and you won the H-1B lottery and you can apply for H-1B in the U.S., that's not a problem. It's only a problem if you're outside the U.S. and you need a visa issuance, then they may not um, um, issue. If you, if you want, you cannot go for a visa interview outside the U.S. and apply for an H-1B visa. But if you're currently in the U.S., yes, you can apply for H-1B with the USCIS and you can get your case approved. And just don't leave the U.S. So that's the caveat. Don't leave the U.S. You can still keep on working in the if it's approved then your um, student status status would change to h1b as of october the first and you don't have to leave the U, U, u.s and um, there's um altogether h h1b cap in a, one given year but actually um 6800 of that number are allocated to people from chile and singapore and this number is not used up every year so if you're um, trying to hire someone from chile or singapore then they are not subject to this proclamation. So you can still apply for their visas and they don't have to apply with the USCIS. They can apply directly at the embassy in their country. So these people are fine. So as long, um, as, long as you're in the US, you're fine. But there is a problem. So what about like people like you, you applied for H-1B? Yes, you, you applied with the USCIS, you got your H-1B, so you're in the US. Now you wanna bring your family over from a foreign country. Okay, this is a problem. <laughs> so the family, probably cannot apply for um, visas. Uh, if, they, if, they are, if your family is already in the U.S., then probably they applied for a dependent status with you, so they're fine. If they are outside the U.S., um, it's highly possible that they cannot apply for a new visa and come into the U.S. But if the government announces, gives different interpretations, then they can come. But as of now, um, the chances are very slim that your family who are currently outside the U.S. and who do not have a valid visa as of June 24th, it's, the chances are very slim that they can get a visa and come back, come back into the U.S. And another mystery is, okay, on the 24th, I was in the U.S. and I had a valid visa, so I'm not subject to the proclamation, but now I want to go out, go out of the U.S. and apply for a new, renew my visa. The proclamation does not talk about that situation, so we really don't know. And um, what we know as of now is um, some consulates in like U.S. Embassy in Mexico, they already announced that they're not going to issue new visas and renewal visas. So it's possible that some consulates will decide not to um, issue renewal visas. As of now, the U.S. Embassy and consulate in Japan has not updated their website 
So um, renewal visa is still a valid um, option on their website, but we have to keep on watching whether that's good or not. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, Okura-sensei, hi. Hi. there's a quick question, um, just I think if I can ask, that came up. It says, what is the definition of food supply? Have you seen any case which someone is likely to get this exemption? Um, right now, as of now, I, I haven't seen an, anyone who's getting this exemption, but I do have a client who is actually in the food supply chain. He's he he is in the logistics for um, chicken <laughs> chicken manufacturing. So like, and I kind of I had no clue about what they were doing. So I studied a lot about the chicken industry, and there is a huge supply chain and the import export rule and everything's very very um, complicated. And I, I believe some of the big chicken factories had coronavirus, had, were affected by the virus, and the, um, the factory had to shut down for like a couple of months or so. So um, these are critical because the chicken supply in the U.S. is a very critical issue, and the U.S. government is watching, is really, really into this. So this is a very big industry. So if you are like in working as an HIV worker for like um, the, anywhere in the supply chain, supply chain for like poultry, uh, po poultry business or beef business or anything, or uh, of course it doesn't have to be meat. I think uh, agriculture is um, considered as well. But if you're in doing some critical, um, you're carrying out critical mission in the supply chain of those food supply chain company, I think you can make a very good case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, um, which slide? Oh, yeah, okay, that's number 14. So um, exceptions to visa issuance and travel um, restrictions. So if we go to um, slide number 15, Yoshi-san. So these categories are not subject to the proclamation, so that's good news, right? But not everyone um, qualified for these kind of visas. So ESTA is a visa waiver program, and this is not for everyone. This is only for um, countries that have some um, agreement with the United States. So um, we Japanese people, we enjoy this ESTA visa program and you can stay in the United States for up to 90 days, but you cannot extend your status in the U.S. and you cannot stay more than 180 days in total in the U.S. in a give, one given year. So that, that's a, so if you're stuck outside the U.S. and um, government decides that, um, government or a consulate decides that they're not going to issue renewal L visas or H-1B visas, and you still have your, your pet here, you have your cat, your dog at the home, pet hospital, I mean, at hotel, not hospital, and you need to come back, then you can apply for ESTA, you can apply online, and it's valid for two years, so you can just come back and quickly, you know, take care of your dog or your house or whatever, and you can only stay up to nine days, and then you have to leave the U.S. After, um, within the 90-day period, so you can do that, or, um, B1, B2 is a temporary um, B, um, tourist visa for Japanese nationals. You get up to 10 years of visas, but each time you can only stay up to 90 or, 90 or 100, not less than 180 days. And thankfully, E1, E2 visa, which is widely used by Japanese nationals, these are not subject to the proclamation. And because these are treaty visas, it's a treaty agreement between countries, so it's not as easy as H-1Bs or L-1s, you have to review, re redo all the treaty agreements. So it's not easy to touch the E-1, E-2 visas. And E-3, E-3 is for Australian people. So if you have an employee or you want to hire someone from Australia and who happens to have a bachelor's degree, then yes, you can apply for E-3 visas and they can apply at their country. They don't have to apply with the USCIS, CIS, they can apply in their country. And TN visa, this is awesome. TN visa is for Canadian and Mexicans. And if you have employees or you want to hire someone from Canada or Mexico who happens to have a degree in the professional list um, that is um, issued by the um, uh, government, then yes, you can, you can apply for TN visas for Canadian and Mexicans. And they, these are mainly people in the technical field, like engineers, computer specialists, or um, in the non-STEM field, there's like accountants qualify or like um, counselor. A human resource counselor, th those people would qualify, but m most of the people are in the engineering or healthcare, healthcare field or medical field. And then H-1B, yes, Chile, Singaporean H-1B are not subject to the proclamation, so these people you can still bring in. And that was not in the proclamation, but someone in, someone, um, in our immigration association spoke with the government and they clarified that this is not, this is not a subject. So F-1 student visas are not subject to the proclamation. M, vocational student visas are okay. And J-1 visas for physicians, 
professors, research scholars, students, they are not subject to the proclamation, so you can still apply for visas and come into the U.S. And there's some other visas that I'm not going to talk about, so you can just look at, go through the alphabet down there. So there's a lot of visas that are not subject to the proclamations. So um, we can go next. Before we leave that slide, uh -huh. uh, for the, Which one? Uh, the NAFTA visa, yes. mm -hmm. did the USMCA change that or did that remain intact? It, it's NAFTA TN visa, right? Right. TN visa is still intact. We have a okay. lot of TN applicants and we're processing it, um, especially because we don't have enough H1B caps. So a TN visa has become very, very popular in the past, maybe okay. past eight years, yes. All right, great. And Can Canadian um, TNs, they don't have to apply for a visa at the embassy, so they can apply for TN at the border, at, at the spot, and then come in. Uh, okay. Mexican nationals have to apply for a visa at the U.S. embassy or consulate in their country, and once they get the visa, and then they can come back in. So, but the problem right now, we can go, yeah, here. Um, the problem what we're having right now is that there's a worldwide visa suspension. So, uh, so even if you're not subject to the proclamation, uh, the U.S. embassies and consulate abroad are not processing visa interviews. So since that started in March 19th, so they stopped interviewing people and currently they're only taking emergency interviews and um, mail-in extension. So if you are one of the category listed in the slide, then, and you're just trying to, you're extending your visa at the same place you applied for, applied last time, then yes, you can mail in the application in Japan. This is not for all countries. I'm just talking about Japan, U.S. Embassy and consulate in Japan. There's a mail-in procedures. So if you qualify under any of these categories and you're just extending it, yes, there's a 14 days quarantine requirement in Japan. So as soon as you get to Japan, you have to, you quarantine yourself, but you can still put all the documents in the mail and send it out. So the, by the time your your quarantine is um, completed, then you may have your visa um, mailed back to you. So that that's a good thing about the U.S. Embassy uh, applying for a visa in Japan. Now, emergency visa interviews, we have been heavily doing this in the past, and I believe Fibusan and Umezaki-san is dealing with this as well. Um, these are for people who can prove that you have a really, really um, uh, what severe emergencies. They could be medical em emergencies or someone in your family died, so you have to come over to the U.S. quickly, or, um, or students, or J-1 visas, or F-1 or M visa um, people. If your program is going to start within 30 days, then yes, you can apply for major em emergency visas. Um, emergency interview appointment. And we have a lot of um, business um, expatriates that we have been applying for emergency interviews. So we have to prove that if this person doesn't come to the U.S., then the U.S. company is going to suffer some kind of damage. So we got to really, really um, kind of work on that. So if, if the employer says, well, if, if he comes or not, that's not going to make a big difference in our business, then no, we won't qualify for an emergency visa. So it has to be someone really critical to your business. <laughs> Well, what I think I think this kind of relates to this. Someone asked um, if the embassy decides not to issue any new visas, which was one of the points that you made in an earlier uh -huh. slide. Are those embassies not going to issue a visa even for those who meet the criteria of exemptions? Exemptions like you know the food supply chain, right? They will issue the visa if you even, apply. Okay. If you can prove that you're you coming into the U.S. is for the national interest of the United States or you're gonna help um, fight the COVID-19, or you're gonna take care of the patients, or you're gonna do research to um, produce a vaccine for the COVID-19. So if you can prove anything like that, uh, that's listed under the exemption, yes, they will issue you an L visa, H-1B visa. So try, in national interest is kind of vague. They do list some criteria, but you could be creative and kind of make your case that you're, you coming to the US is gonna help the U.S. economy to recover faster by having maintaining all these people employed, or I think you can make a case. Mm. But if that person coming doesn't really make a difference to your company, then no, you can't make a case. You can't you can't just lie <laughs> and make up a case. It has to be something real. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And um, so we're going to slide 17. So. Like I said, there are not um, having routine visa interviews now um, since 
March of 19th. And what is bad is that they, first of all, they said that for the first month or two, they were not going to accept interviews. And then people started um, getting interview reservations for June, July, and August. And then every two weeks, the a consulate will announce that, okay, we're going to cancel the interview for the next two weeks. And then we wait for another two weeks and then they'll announce we're going to cancel for another two weeks. And then ha that has been going on since March 19th. And as of today, all the interviews have been canceled. So people only who qualify for the emergency visa or, or mail in extensions, those are the people who are able to get the visas and come back in. So even if you do not, you are not subject to the proclamation, and still, there's no visa interviews going on right now. And in Japan, um, the, the interview slots are filled until uh, August, so we can't even book an interview for you until the next month's come, the new month comes available, becomes available. So that's where we are right now. Um, but yesterday, the um, government announced that they are going to gradually start opening up visa interviews, routine visa interviews, but they don't give the details because it's going to depend on the COVID situation in each country. So they can't just say everyone, okay, we're going to open up. That's not going to happen. You have to consider the country that you're in. And if the COVID situation is bad in that country, they're still not going to open it up. And you have to make sure that all the security measures are in place, that the sanita sanitation and everything's in place and the masks and everything. So if, if the local, local consulate or embassy are kind of, um, satisfied that it's safe to open up the visa interview, they will start doing it. But as of now, I think they're giving priority to emergency interview people and students whose program are going to start. The student is F1M and um, J1 um, exchange visitors. Um, if their program is starting within 30 days, then they're going to give priority to those people first. And um, now that goes to our last session, last slide, um, future regulations and ways to stretch strategically navigate immigration policy. So the proclamation, there was two proclamations that, that were issued, but that's not the end of the story because um, the government said that, okay, okay, Department of State and Department of Labor and USCIS Immigration, you guys come up with some plans to um, develop some rules or regulations to um, further investigate the current situation of certain visa categories. So the potential steps that's going to be taken by the agency in the coming months are EB2 and EB3 immigrant visa. Is This is a green card application. There's like five categories for green card applications. And EB2 is EB3 is commonly used by um, people who are working in the U.S. in H-1B, L visas or E visas. So those people um, have to make sure that they're not taking away um, job from U.S. Um, workers. So, and H-1B-2, H-1B and EB-2, EB-3 immigrant visas, the government's saying that you have to come up with a, um, some kind of a plan to make sure that these people are not taking away work from U.S. workers. And another, um, the second point is the LCA. LCA is, is a document that you have to follow with the H-1B petition, and it has the prevailing wage um, information in, in the wage information of the individuals that you're trying to hire in H-1B. So um, they're going to, probably they're going to do an invest investigation or audit on uh, their LCAs, whether the company is paying the wage that they said they were going to be paid, they're going to pay for these individuals. And companies have to be very careful about this because during the COVID-19, some people were um, furloughed or like re working on reduced hours or working in different um, locations. For H-1B employees, you cannot necessarily do that. So you, I, I'm sure that you're um, talking to your councils, but um, there are certain regulations for H-1Bs. If you need to reduce their time, you have to file an amended petition before you reduce the time. If you're going to put them in another location to work, then um, if the location was not covered in the first petition, then you have to file an amended petition. So there's some rules for h and employees. So you, better, you have to be very careful about moving around or changing the employment terms of h and employees, and you have to do it right. And um, prioritize h and visa allocation. That was one of the um, bullet points in the proclamation. So what we're thinking is probably right now there's 85,000 h and slots in a given year, and people are randomly selected through the lottery because there's the more than three times of applications <laughs> than the um, number that's allotted, allowed in a given year. So um, everyone has to go to, through a random um, h and lottery 
and probably like 50% or maybe 40% or 50% of the people win the lottery and then they get to get adjudicated. But now they're saying that maybe they're going to give priority to H-1B workers who are being paid a high salary and not lower income so that they don't compete with U.S. workers. And uh, other points, yeah, um, uh, if we don't get right now, like people who have criminal on um, background, um, sometimes if you meet certain um, elements, then they could get the employment authorization cards, but they're, the government's saying that if they have any criminal background, they're gonna be deported and don't give um, employment authorization cards to them because we don't want them taking work away from the um, US workers. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so currently, um, we're, I'm having a lot of, and I think everyone is having a lot of problems. And what I hear is that um, now the presidential proclamation is restricting certain um, expatriates from going back to, the, to Japan to extend their visa, or maybe they just want to go for a business trip, but they're kind of uncertain whether they can come back or they can renew their visa and come back. And actually, we do have people who went back to Japan to uh, extend their L1 visa because the proclamation doesn't say um, they cannot renew their visa. It doesn't say they can renew or they can't renew. So we, we're in a limbo. We don't know. But what I'm hearing is that um, they, they they are processing the interviews in Japan, the embassy and consulate in Japan, but they're holding on to the issue. So they have the interview, but they're not getting their visas and we don't know how long. And they're just waiting for some instruction guidance from the central government. So we don't know how long they're going to be kept there. So some people are just saying, okay, I'm not going to wait any longer because we don't know if we're going to wait for another week or two weeks or two months and at the end of the day then we're not going to get the visa. there's a possibility we're not going to get the visa so some people are just coming back on ESTA to take care of their dogs and, and then just take care of their dogs in house and then return back to Japan. Um, visa interview cancellation is a problem um, if, kept, if their visas are canceled they can't go back to Japan and then now their status in the U.S. is expiring so what do we do? Um, everything's fine, but my flight was canceled. I can't go back to Japan. My status ex is expiring. What should I do? Um, I want to go back to Japan, but Japan has a 14 days quarantine requirement. And then once you come back to the U.S., you have another 14 days quarantine requirement. So, and so altogether, about a month, you cannot go to work. So I cannot risk that. I'm the only one who's, who's responsible for the quality of this production line. No, we can't do that. So, uh, and, um, especially HR departments are having a hard time planning their human resource <laughs> like transfer because everything's like uncertain at this time. Um, so, and driver's license renewal. So if you, if you can come back with ESTA, like a, um, a visa waiver program, but in, in that case, you can't renew, renew your driver's license. So, so what's the other option? So how do we navigate through this um, given situation? So first of all, if you're in the U.S. and and you're not in e visa status, then um, you have HMB L L1. You could extend your status in the U.S. And the good thing is that if you file your extension before your current I-94, your status validation um, validity of your status expires, then you can work up to a maximum of 20, 240 days while you're waiting for the adjudication. So that's the good part. But you cannot stay more than the maximum time you're allowed to stay in the U.S. H-1B has a maximum time of six years, and L-1A um, managers and executives can stay up to seven years in total in the U.S. And non-managers can stay a total of five years in the U.S. So you cannot exceed that. But if you're not exceeding that um, um, maximum time period while you're waiting for your extension petition in the U.S., you can still work up to 24 days after your current status expires. So that's a good thing. And premium processing resumed um, recently. So if you want to expedite the processing, you can just pay um, $1,440 and then you could have your case processed in 15 days. But if you get a request for additional evidence, it may take another three months to gather all the evidence and respond to the government. Um, or, for example, you're maxing out your H-1B status or your L status, so you're already at the maximum six years. Um, for H-1B people, if you apply, started applying for a green card and you satisfy certain elements, then you can extend your H-1B beyond the six years max. But if that's not the case, then if you're maxing out your L or H-1B time, what do you do? You can change your status to e-visa or some other visa categories, depending on your nationality and the nationality of your company. 
So you can consider like um, whether you qualify for E1, E2 treaty visa or E3. If you have an Australian employee, then see whether he qualifies for E3. Or if you have Canadian, Mexican, see whether they qualify for TN. Yeah, so um, you could consider all those kind of visas. And I, I had some clients who were saying, okay, my, my time's up, my visa's expiring, my status is expiring, I'm on my way back to Japan, I'm gonna be transferred back to Japan, but my flight was canceled. I can't go back and now my status expires, then what do I do? So she's not trying to stay here to work in the US, she's just waiting until she can get on another flight, but her status is gonna to expire tomorrow. What, what should we do? You can change your status to B, B2 um, visitor status. So even if it's not approved, if you um, apply for B2 visitor status before your current I-94 expires, you're going to be you're going to be in um, legal status in the U.S. You'll be out of status, but you can stay in the U.S. legally until the petition is approved. And once you you get the flight back to Japan, then don't worry about that. Just get on the plane and go back to Japan, and then we can withdraw the petition for you. So at least you could keep you could stay in the legal legal status. So if you so if you apply for B to another status before your current I-94 expires, after your I-94 I-94 expires, you are in violation of immigration status, but the um, overstay does not start counting until you have the result. So you can still stay in the U.S. Um, so we already talked about the U.S. Embassy Consulate. So they're, they're um, taking emergency requests and mailing on um, visa extension applications. So consider whether you qualify under those um, emergency requests or mailing visa um, applications, but you do have to monitor um, the, US, the information on the U.S. Embassy in your country to see whether they're going to process renewal visas. But we know that if you're in H1B or L, they're not going to issue new visas, but renewal, new renewal visas, we're not quite sure at this time. So, okay, Sensei, I know, I know there's so much more that you want to share. Um, we're getting a little bit close to time, and I want to make sure our, um, our panels yeah. get the chance to, to yeah. share their insights as well. Would it be okay if we... Sure, uh, go ahead. Okay, and I know there's a lots of questions um, that we've been receiving, and um, we'll open up uh, more questions at the end if we have more time, and we might not. Um, if that's the case, uh, we will share uh, Okura Sensei's um, contact information with your permission, Okura Sensei. Sure. Uh, so then you can ask um, a lot of detailed questions. I know it really depends on your employer, what your status is, um, the country that you're from, um, and, and it might change tomorrow, so. <laughs> oh, that's a scary part, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Sorry that we had to cut you off. I know you've-, you've Oh, no, so I'm, much I'm almost done, so that's fine. We went okay. through all the yeah, bullet points, and so we're good. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Well then, um, so Phil and Mizaki san you're both from, um, from Kubota. Can you please share a little bit about your, your company? Yeah, let me uh, just start by thank you for uh, inviting us to join. Uh, we've been a part of the uh, community here in Georgia since 1988. So we started out with uh, 38 uh, local staff and six Japanese expats. And today we have about 2,700 employees, uh, including about 50 expats plus their family members. So we have uh, quite a Japanese population here on a rotational basis. And we are operating uh, basically five manufacturing plants uh, located uh, between Gainesville and Jefferson. And we're producing tractors and zero turn mowers, utility vehicles, uh, finished products, mostly for domestic US market, but we do export about 15 to 20% of our products, even exporting to Japan. So um, I would just say that uh, this has been a very interesting, we're, we're uh, grateful to be a part of the uh, conversation. Uh, we were a little nervous when we heard just rumors of, of the uh, emergency or of the situation <laughs> with the proclamations. However, fortunately for us, all of our folks are on uh, e-visas. And uh, so, but however, the, the, besides the coronavirus, um, we have had issues with uh, folks that we want to rotate that are not able to get uh, interviews for for routine visa interviews to come over here for so that some of our folks that have been here for four or five years can go home. 
So um, we're experiencing some of that, but we are walking through that. We have also had experience recently applying for an emergency visa uh, for the uh, interview, and it uh, looks like that's going very successfully. So um, we, we had a, a very strong business case that we were able to make uh, and very, very responsive. The uh, U.S. consulate in Osaka was very responsive and, and responded to our request for that uh, in a positive way. So we've been very fortunate to do that. Uh, so we're very careful and very thoughtful not to request emergencies for all of them, even though some folks would like to go home and that may seem like an emergency to them. Uh, but, uh, but we're being very cautious not to request emergencies for, unless it really is. And, and out of all those cases, we have one that we felt was a, a strong business case emergency that we have applied for. So that's kind of a background. Great, thank you so much, Phil. But actually, Phil, can you um, share a little bit about what your responsibilities are? So uh, my responsibilities at Kubota Manufacturing, uh, I've been with the company almost 16 years. Uh, I am the uh, vice president of administration, so I'm in charge of uh, human resources and safety and training and IT and accounting and legal and general affairs. <laughs> Wonderful. You ha you you uh, you have a lot of responsibilities. That's what what I took out from that. Yeah, Thank many you. Hats. <laughs> yes, many hats. And then Umezak Sun, please um, tell us a little about you and your role. Hi. Hello. Uh, good uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm Yuta Umezaki. So HR coordinator for Kame. So actually, I've been assigned to uh, U.S. From Japan. I've been here for two years. As you said that uh, I'm supporting the uh, HR and training and safety portion as a uh, coordinator. And uh, I want to uh, introduce a little bit about the company. So in addition to Phil. So we are producing the uh, small tractor and the UT coal and the turf and the other equipment in Georgia. And uh, in Japan, uh, maybe you may know the Kubota, and uh, you, I know, we are known as an agricultural company. But uh, in Japan, we are also produce the water pipes and the uh, bending machine and uh, like engines and the other uh, industry equipment. Yep. And uh, as for the uh, restriction. As Oklasan explained, we are also facing uh, same, uh, such an issue that you might have. And uh, I've been consulting with her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said that, uh, yeah, we, we, we had a critical position. And uh, we submitted a letter and uh, accepted, fortunately. So thank you, Oklasan. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, well, Mazak san you, uh, you're in the middle of this. I mean, Phil as well, you're in the oh, middle, yeah. of this, especially Mazak san So, because you, you are um, the foreign national working here in the mm -hmm. U.S., um, mm -hmm. I, I can only imagine how stressful everything uh, <laughs> is for you. And also, especially coordinating between the, you know, the, the expats and their family. Um, I'm sure they have a lot of questions. What What is the, the the most common question that you get from from the expats, the Japanese expats here in, in the U.S.? Common question? Yeah, the number one question you get right now. Is it when we can go back or what would... Oh, what would yeah, 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 yeah. How can, yes. And uh, also like uh, UPS is also stop. Yes. And as uh, yeah, some coordinator is usually, yeah, have, have them, uh, their family send that some food or like, uh, yeah, some Japanese things to US. So it's also our concern. Yes. And it will be studying, yeah. 
I, I, so I, we I, have, uh, we, you know, interesting. Yeah. I mean, we've had situations that are very difficult because obviously if a family member goes back to Japan because of a family emergency, they still have to quarantine in a hotel for 14 days in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then even coming back, then they have to uh, quarantine in a hotel or we had cases where uh, family members, uh, spouses have had children, had babies, and their mothers and fathers want to come and see these new babies or be here for the birth experience, and they have to quarantine. So that means the employee has been exposed to a foreign visitor. So now they have to quarantine, even though they haven't left the country. So a lot of challenges with, with these uh, travel, and uh, even though emergencies are available, but lots of challenges. Yeah, absolutely. All these challenges that we've never, ever thought before. So with that said, um, how are you dealing with them? From, from, the, uh, from the perspective of, you know, our, our team members, we're being very, very careful to make sure that we limit, you know, exposure and limit official travel. No one's, we still don't allow, which is very difficult for an international company. We don't allow any international travel uh, for business purposes right now. So that's been very, very difficult, but we have had folks that have left and gone back to Japan and it's very stressful for uh, a young member to, who's here on a company to go back to Japan and not be able to join his family or her family because they have to stay in the hotel uh, in Tokyo for t two weeks before they can go home. And so we're, you know, we're trying to encourage people. Also, there's been a lot of concern about uh, my E2 is expiring. So uh you know, what do I do? And so a lot of, a lot of those kind of questions and really just trying to get really good communication. We've been in communication with uh, Masai-san to make sure that we're giving them good information and reliable information. That's really been the key is giving them good, current, reliable information and tell them not to worry and do our best to take care of them. Mm, yeah, that seems like, um, you know, especially with COVID-19, the, the one thing that came out of this is really how transparent you are in really giving them the, the, the good quality information and being honest with what you know and what you don't know and um, really being clear with that. Um, is there a certain, talking about communication, this is one question um, and something I see a lot. Is there a certain... Um, like channel or ways that you communicate these important informations? Is, is there a certain way that you uh, use like an internal website, emails, letters? Like what is the, the way you communicate? So I, I think Umezaki-san can speak for okay. internally with the coordinators, yeah. but for the whole company, we're really using, you know, social media, electronic, especially email and uh, web posting. We use a, our ADP system for notifications and, and we have uh, web blasting information, you know, uh, phone blasting or text blasting information. So we're trying to keep it, in, you know, information that way. Uh, but I'm sure uh, Yuta can talk about within the within the uh, expat family, maybe a little bit different. Yeah. How how do you communicate with the expats? Ms. Like so, yes, regarding yeah, expats. As Phil mentioned, yeah, basically we communicate. So overall. Basically, Phil send out such a communication email to everybody. So, in addition to that, I will follow up the coordinators with Japanese language. So, basically, yeah, that too, yeah, basically, yeah, such a social media and uh, email. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they have question, so I will answer individually. Lots of lots of work there. I'm yeah, sure. lots of work. Yeah, <laughs> 50, yeah, yeah, 50 people. Yeah, and it's each, and inclu yeah, yeah, including each, family, maybe 100. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, I'm sure you have long hours, late nights, sleepless yeah. nights as well. So, as Phil mentioned, that uh, we had a family member, uh, we have a family member who had a baby. <laughs> a baby. So, it's a very tough situation in this it was under twins. these circumstances <laughs> twins yeah oh twins oh my goodness two twins, two wow. twins. wow wow well that's two sets definitely... of twins <laughs> sets, of, sets of twins so two four babies people, total right four babies total so four babies oh, <laughs> wow 
I'm sure everyone will never forget these twins, right? We'll all remember. You'll all yeah. remember them. Exactly. A, yes. yes, what a story. Um, you know, I can only just imagine, but what, what would you say the biggest impact is with this, um, you know, change of the, the visa restrictions and, and all this, like the changes, the chaos that you're going through right now? Um, what is the biggest impact on your business? What would you say the impact is? Uh, you know, the truth is it's really given, it, it's given us new opportunities to strengthen our business through ways that we didn't even imagine. We, we used to do a lot of business travel because that's just the way you did business, uh, even domestically. But we're finding that just like what we're doing now uh, with the web uh, webinars and, and we do these for some of our daily meetings. And actually we found a lot of, of efficiencies um, but there are still challenges and difficulties, uh, you know, and, and I, I uh, worry about the, uh, the family members all the time because it's bad enough to be outside of your home country in a place where you don't really know everybody and you're uncomfortable, but now you're quarantined and stuck in a house or, or your kids can't go to school. And, and so I think it's unique challenges that, that you know, we, we have concerns. I personally have a lot of concerns about the uh, our Japanese family members and uh, and keeping them safe uh, making sure that they have access to, to medical care uh, one gentleman we were on the phone with uh, all weekend trying to get him into a doctor because he was you know he was ill and uh, trying to you know not all the the doctor's offices are not operating the way they used to so these these kind of issues that we've we've been uh, working through, but it's been challenging, but it's also been rewarding because we're learning something. Oh, that's wonderful. I think that that mindset just, you know, it makes a big difference looking at this, not as um, a problem, but looking as an opportunity and challenge. Yeah. Clearly. And uh, one of the realities that you have just shared, and we appreciate your sharing it, is the personal side of all of this. It, as important as it is for the businesses, the jobs, the investment, Ultimately, it's about people. Mm -hmm. And what you're sharing is something that really brings it to heart and mind. And so thank you for that. And it's one of those kinds of issues and opportunities that we need to, in a friendly way, remind our electeds at the national level in particular and their professional staffs. Uh, those kinds of stories, I think, really resonate with everyone, no matter where you are on the political spectrum. So thank you. And we've been very fortunate that, uh, for example, uh, Congressman Doug Collins from our area came out and actually visited the plant, visited with our expats and uh, local staff. And he's been instrumental in helping even with the emergency visa issue. So it's, that's very true. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. So we're, we're getting, we have only five more minutes left. Um, so is there, uh, I think we'll move on to the Q&A. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, unfortunately, you probably won't be able to get through all of them, but we'll do our best. So your son, do you mind kicking up us with the first question? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the first question uh, kind of goes back to Okura Sensei, back to your presentation. Uh, so Okura Sensei, what is the actual chance of getting the emergency appointment for non-immigrant visa? Um, if you have examples, if you can share it just very quickly. Yeah, well, you know, um, I, I never had a problem with ex um, a president, CEO, or president, even without uh, providing all those documents, that, that, like it was very quick. But I'm hearing from some of my clients who have headquarters in Japan and they're processing, but the chances are like, even if you're like a vice president, you could get it denied, but a person who, who is an IT person could get it uh, approved. So it's really about what is the emergency? Is, is it really gonna be a big impact on your company? Are you, is your company gonna suffer damage? It, it, uh, they can't operate if this person doesn't come. So it really depends on what the emergency is and what kind of damage you're gonna suffer if this person doesn't come. So if you can provide sufficient information about that, then I think the chances are pretty good. And I, I know uh, Mizaki-san has uh, shared that uh, some some of their emergency cases uh, were uh, kind of approved. Uh, and then Okura says, I think you already answered this, but 14 day quarantine in US from another country, is that mandatory or just a recommendation or guideline? 
it's kind of mandatory um but you know like for example in hawaii they they um they have a fine if you if you do not um, abide by that rule then you could get fined and you can go to jail and it, actually there was a person who went to jail in georgia at the drafting stage there was a penalty um clause in the drafting like I think it was like two thousand dollars in penalty and then imprisonment as another penalty but the final version came out without those kind of penalties so if you're supposed to be in quarantine and i think there was a person a couple who went to italy and came back who didn't quarantine themselves and they were just hanging out downtown and they got caught and they they'll tell you to go back to your house so there's no penalty in georgia but it is enforceable so someone would come over and tell you to go home but you're not going to be in prison in georgia but it is enforceable. So if you're in Hawaii, sure you do quarantine. I guess it sounds yes. like it's mandatory in Hawaii, but in Georgia uh, or any other place, um, you know, it is strongly recommended. So it's better that you do quarantine. Uh, and then um, Okura said this may be uh, more of a question, uh, maybe for the consulate or the embassy of Japan. But what okay. about restrictions going into Japan? Do you know any insights about um, issuing visas? You know, Americans or other foreign nationals who want to go to Japan. Yes, the, uh, Japan also has a list of countries that if you have been to certain countries in the past 14 days, and I don't have that statistic in front of me, but they do have a list of certain countries if you have been into those countries in the past 14 days that you cannot enter, the, enter Japan unless you're a Japanese citizen or um, or a green card, um, you don't call them permanent residents. I'm not quite sure about that, but I heard that some of the permanent res residents were unable to go back to Japan. But there is a list on the MOF MOFA um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs or um, the immigration site in Japan. So they, they are similar restrictions, something similar to the US. And I think they lifted it recently for certain countries in Southeast Asia. I think they lifted it recently, but I'm not quite sure about all, all the details. All right, Okura, so we have two more questions and we have one more minute. Who decides um, if uh, essential worker for food supply chain, is it the uh, the U.S. Embassy in Japan um, or consulate, is it the DHS or the USCIS? Like who decides whether you're essential or not in the food supply industry? The, the consulate and the Department of um, USCIS, the Department of Homeland Security and consulate, they are in um, communication with each other. But if you're um, going to um, apply in Japan for a visa stamp, then probably the consulate and the embassy will, uh, at their discretion, would decide whether you fall under the national interest or the emergency visa category or whether you're really essential to the food supply chain. If you're applying for an extension in the U.S., then probably it's going to be the Department of Homeland Security, the USCIS Immigration Office, is going to decide whether your case is um, approvable or not. Wow, you're a two. Every, every question I ask, you have an answer very quickly. So last question. <laughs> Uh, regarding L and H-1B visas, do you expect the situation to change or is it going to be extended to next year, you think? I know you can't. I think, I think it's going to really um, come up to how, how good we are in control of the COVID-19 situation. The situation, and because the COVID-19 situation is directly related to the unemployment rate in the United States as well. As this goes bad, and then we may see more and more un unemployment in the United States, and the proclamation was very specific to helping the U.S. recover and getting those people unemployed back to work. So it's not necessarily that, the, you know, like we have an equality insurance um, specialist coming from Japan, and because you didn't allow him to come into the United States, so someone who's unemployed in the U.S. could take his place. It doesn't work like that, so it's not like a simple math or something, but um, I think, well, the Immigration Association is, um, Immigration Lawyers Association is preparing to file a lawsuit against the government. So I think there, they, if um, they can make a case, there could be a temporary injunction against the proclamation and there could be a stop. So until the final um, sentence comes out, the, the judge can stop the proclamation from going into place. So that could happen if, if they can make a case. Um, but if the situation gets bad, it could go over the next year. That, that's possible because right now it says every 60 days, the government is supposed to um, review the proclamation, just taking a look and reviewing the situation that we're in right now, and then they can make adjustments. And even the first proclamation, the April proclamation, it was supposed to end in June, but now it was extended to December. So if the situation doesn't improve, there is a possibility it can go into the next year. But now we're facing presidential elections. So that's going to kick in as well. 
So if we have a new president by next year, then maybe they're going to come up with a newer pol new policy. So we don't know. Anything's possible at this time. I know this is a very serious situation, so uh, things could change at any moment, right? But thank you so much for, for your expertise, Okura-sensei. And then just uh, one question from, from me is, um, would it be okay for us to share your PowerPoint presentation with our sure. audience? Sure. Uh, I wasn't able to go through each and every situation, so the PowerPoint has more detail, so you can um, look at, um, you can refer to that, and then, but make sure that's only information as of today, so tomorrow the information may change. So always consult with your lawyer, and the most important things to get through all these difficult times is to consult with um, your counsel and know all your options. It's not only about you, it's also about your family, your children, your school, you have driver's license for your spouse, or if whether your child could continuously go to school in the United States or not. So it's about everyone. So make sure you know all your options and consider all the options, cons and pros for each. There's no win-win situation, but just consider all the cons and pros for each option and make your best um, informed decision. And here is our open says contact information uh, on the screen. So if you have any questions in English, and but thank you very much, Okura Sensei, and thank you very much, Joe and Umezaki san from Kubota. Uh, and thank you so much, Nozomi san, for another wonderful job of moderating. At this time, I would like to ask our chair, Mr. Al Hodge, for some closing remarks. Well, thank you, Yoshi, and thank you for all of your preparation, always professional. And of course, Nozomi san, thank you. Uh, we also, uh, Okura san, your expertise, along with our friends from Kubota, thank you. And something else that I think our uh, participants would want to know if they don't already, and that is that uh, we heard the phenomenal growth of Kubota in Georgia, and that is uh, significant in and of itself. They also use a lot of suppliers from around the state of Georgia and have attracted suppliers. OTR Wheel Engineering, company, for instance, in Rome has long been a supplier and a great partner with Kubota, and they've always had very positive, strongly positive uh, compliments to Kubota. Therefore, the numbers we heard earlier about all the people that they've employed, uh, I don't think includes all the different suppliers and the additional positive impact that uh, Kubota provides to our state. So thank you, and thank you for being a member of the Japan America Society of Georgia which is the perfect segue for in thanking all of our members and to invite those of you that are participating in the webcast, we would welcome your membership as well and your participation. If you look at jasgeorgia.com or JASG, uh, check that, uh, you'll see that there is an abundance of programs for education and culture and of course business and uh, the public policy discussions that take place around the table uh, and in webinars like these has been very, very valuable for our members. So therefore, take a look at the calendar of events as well as the other parts of the content uh, for that. Uh, you also will get to meet the committee chairs and good folks like our vice chair, uh, Jessica Cork from YKK uh, Tim Evans uh, is on our board from the Greater Hall Chamber of Commerce, a unified economic development and chamber in Northeast Georgia. Uh, really, if you take a look at the membership, Yoshi has marked where all of our members are and they're from throughout the state of Georgia. Additionally, we thank our Japanese friends for the great relationship, the decades long relationship, uh, and the number of companies in Georgia that also operate in Japan, notably, but not limited to Aflac and Coca-Cola and Delta. There really are some very fine corporate partners and of course a myriad of independent businesses, uh, folks like me, that also benefit from the Japan-Georgia business relationships. A lot of professionals with the accounting realm, uh, legal, and so forth. So we invite your active participation 
and uh, uh, we certainly appreciate your support. Uh, and with that, I will return control to Yoshi Domoto. Great. Thank you, everyone. Please join us again next. Uh, we'll have uh, many, many more uh, webinars coming up. But most of all, be safe, be healthy. And thank you again to Okura Sensei, Phil Sutton, and Umezaki san from Kubota, and our expert and lovely moderator, Ms. Nozomi Morgan. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.